C. Perry. Uh, in your handout, you certainly saw some of his background, but just to highlight, uh, Tracy is a former Army National Guard GI and was a member of the Idaho Guard where Audie Murphy, when Audie Murphy was a guard in the Texas. He is an Air Force veteran of six and a half years uh, from back in the 1900, ni from, well, 1990, no. It says 1900s. <laughs> but anyway, you're not, you're not that old. <laughs> but Tracy spent time in Alaska when it was still a territory. So yeah, that was kind of a while ago. Uh, and if back then you actually got overseas pay because it was still considered a territory. Uh, he was an air traffic controller in Longmont for 18 years, uh, and that's probably why he's gotten gray around the chin there and stuff. Uh, and then a retired storage tech technical writer. And his you know, talk today is as outlined uh, up on our screen there about a un great uncle or uncle? Uncle. Uh, and, and a very kind of sad story, but you know, that's what war is about. So, anyway, Tracy, please come. Okay, good. Thank you, Mike. And thank you very much for the, <laughs> the introduction and for the invitation to come back again and thank all of you for coming out. Um, I hope you enjoy what we've got. I just found out that I'm gonna have a special announcement at the end of the presentation today and I'll hold that for later. To give you just a little bit of a, a background, my brother and I knew my uncle Paul um, not very well because both of us were still babes in arms uh, when we were born and then he went off to uh, the Navy. But over the years, the two of us have heard all kinds of stories and people talk about it and one thing and another. A few years ago, my brother, who's a kind of an amateur historian, decided that he thought he could take about 10 or 15 pages and put something together about Uncle Paul and something he could pass on to the kids and his grandkids. So he started doing a little bit of research, wound up going coast to coast, a lot of archives and one thing and another. When he was finished, he had over 200 pages. And it was everything on our Uncle Paul uh, from basically from the day he was born uh, until after his services uh, after World War II. So he did a tremendous amount of work for it. My uncle is there. That's a picture of him. Uh, he was born in El Dorado, Kansas and raised in El Dorado, Kansas, graduated from high school. He was the first of four brothers and uh, all the rest of them, of course, were, were much younger. They were known around El Dorado as the Perry Boys or the Perry Brothers. Never did anything really malicious, but maybe mischievous, we'll call it that. There was a farm not too far from their place. And this guy that did the farming down there had all kinds of cottontails. And the brothers loved to hunt cottontails. So the four of them went down there one day knocked on the door and talked to the farmer and asked him very nicely, could we hunt on your property if we promise to be very careful and don't shoot any of your livestock or mess up any of your crops? And the farmer went absolutely ballistic. He said, you get your butts off of my property. Don't ever come back. If you come back and I catch you, the sheriff's going to be over here. On and on and on. And since those boys were Perry's, they kind of took that as a no. <laughs> Halloween was coming up in about a week. So on their way home, they thought, okay, what can we do to show our displeasure? So they had this little plan. They went down to the farmer's place just after dark. The farmer had a Model T truck and it was sitting out in the yard. And the boys went over there and got to working on that truck. Well, the next morning the farmer gets up and he can't find his truck. And he looks all over the place and calls the, the sheriff. And the sheriff comes out, the sheriff says, I need to walk the property a little bit, see if I can find some uh, information or uh, some kind of evidence 
and try to figure out what happened. So as he's walking around with the farmer, the sheriff stops and he said, what color was your pickup or your truck? And he said, black, like everything else. He said, it looked a lot like that one up on top of the barn. <laughs> and what the boys had done is completely disassembled that Model T truck took all of the parts up to the roof and reassembled it to where it was in perfect running order, but nowhere to drive it. That was the one I called mischief. <clears throat> so the boys, uh, <laughs> the boys managed to, uh, to live through that one. Uh, Paul enlisted in the Navy in June of 1934 and was on the uh, cruiser, the Omaha, that bring back any memories to anybody here? Nobody was on the Omaha. During that time, about 1936, Paul came home on leave. <clears throat> and the local newspaper found out that Paul and his grandfather were in the same town. And they wanted to do an article on it. So this came out on the front page of the paper. So Paul is there on the right. Granddad was 96 at the time. And right after this picture was taken, within about a month or so, Granddad passed away. Granddad was the last surviving Civil War veteran for the Union Army, uh, the last survivor in Butler County, Kansas, and died when he was 96 years old. So this picture was uh, really a family treasure for everyone. Uh, back in the Navy again, finished out his tour, was discharged in 1938 in June. And during that time, uh, he married a lady from California named Rosella. And they had a daughter, Evelyn, which was named after my grandmother's middle name, Evelyn. And uh, daughter Evelyn was born in February of 1940. <clears throat> now, if you do the math on this, he re-enlisted in the Navy in April of 1940. So there was uh, February, March, and part of April that he spent time with his daughter. It was the last time he ever saw them. When he re-enlisted, it was actually his younger brother that was a recruiter and talked him into re-enlisting in the Navy. And they knew that something was going on, things were starting to go bad in the world. So he re-enlisted to go in. Uh, one of the conditions, believe it or not, he had to take basic training again, boot camp. And are there any veterans in here that would like to go through boot camp a second time? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I feel the same way. Once was enough. But they made a deal that after he got out of boot camp, he would get his rating back so he'd become a seaman first class again. So that worked out uh, pretty good. He was assigned to the USS Canopus, and the Canopus had a, a little bit of history. It was built as a banana boat in 1919, so there wasn't an awful lot of uh, uh, anything below decks other than just an open area where you could store bananas. Uh, it was launched in 1919, 1919 by, as the SS Santa Leonora, and in July of 19, 20, or 1919, in July, it uh, went to the Navy as the USS Santa Leonora. In September of 1919, it went to the Army. Not sure what the Army was going to do with that, but by November of 1921, it went back to the Navy. The only thing I, got, I can figure is that the Army didn't know how to find first gear to get, get it moving. <laughs> January 1922, it was christened the USS Canopus. And uh, the Canopus, uh, the name Canopus is the brightest star in one of the southern constellations. The guys called it everything. And crew members can do that, as you Navy people know. She was called Mama Song, the old lady, the fat lady, the banana boat, can of pus, can of something else that started with P. Actually, that's what it was. Uh, it was okay for the crew to do that, but you didn't do that to somebody else's ship. And if somebody else in a bar said something about your ship, 
then there were probably, my guess would be 25, 30,000 bar fights over the years for someone degrading their ship. That's just the way it went. Uh, Paul joined the AS-9 in uh, China at Xingtao, and she was docked there and had her brood of uh, submarines. Uh, this is a picture that was taken in China, official Navy, Navy photograph. And when he got on the ship, when Paul got on there, he found out that there weren't any bunks. And here's a ship with two complete uh, places down below decks where they can make stuff, and complete machine shops. So eventually, they made enough stuff to where they could hang hammocks and have a place for the guys to sleep. And this was her brood, uh, one of the pictures. This was in China. And those were six of the ones that she worked with. And uh, what this uh, subtender did was resupply everything on the submarines. They'd pull up alongside, uh, they'd get food, water, and one of the videos I saw even ice cream, which they loved. Uh, movies that were relatively new, uh, torpedoes, uh, anything that they needed to get them back out to sea and get them back in, into the war. The, there's uh, 12 of them that she worked with. And I don't know if any of these names ring a bell to any of you Navy folks, but uh, those are the ones. This was their captain when uh, Paul joined the ship. Uh, his name was Sackett, and he was from Nampa, Idaho, which is right near where my brother lived while he was writing this book. Uh, he was in the Army National Guard, as you can tell, uh, the wrap leggings. Uh, this was back then. Uh, went to the Naval Academy and graduated in 1920, actually a year early, because they needed officers, and they basically cut out the whole senior year. So he was into the military. And then, of course, right after that, uh, Pearl Harbor eventually happened, and the whole, the whole war effort changed, and Paul was now really involved in a lot of what was going on. By the time this happened, the Canopus was in uh, the Philippines. And up here is Marve in the Marvelous Harbor, or the bay, and right in there, there's a small cove, and that's where the Canopus, or Canopus, whichever way you want to pronounce it, that's where it was anchored. And here you can see it a little bit better, and another shot, still right there. No facilities out there. And this is a little bit uh, bigger picture of it, the Caracol Cove. And it was this, basically this just a little bitty cove back in there where she was... Uh, uh, what, what island is this? Uh, on uh, uh, the main island of uh, the Philippines. Uh, yeah. And here was a drawing that one of the sailors did. They had two or three guys on the boat that... Uh, uh, or on the ship, excuse me, uh, two or three guys that, uh, that knew how to draw, and a lot of these things they drew pictures of. Uh, the Canopus was right down here with the uh, right side or the starboard side up against the, uh, the rocks. And the harbor, let's see, Bataan was right in here, and then, of course, out to sea down on the bottom. <clears throat> Some of the guys in uh, the Philippines were not real happy with the support that they got or did not get. So this came out of one of the uh, correspondence that my brother found. On uh, December the night of the 29th, uh, the Canopus took a 500-pound Japanese bomb in the uh, fantail, went through four decks and exploded, and took out the drive shaft or the prop shaft housing. So it basically put them out of commission as far as getting out to sea. Six of the crew were killed from scalding and fires. On January the 1st, it took another hit from a 500 pounder. 
and it took part of the stack off of uh, uh, one of the, the boilers. It was still looking like uh, a target because it was sitting right side up in that little cove. And they knew that uh, the Japanese would find that as a target and, uh, and try to disable it and sink it. So the soldiers or the, the sailors on board decided that maybe there was some way they could do something about that. So they had the machine shop below decks build some great big long metal spikes, went up onto the shore and drove those into the rocks. Then they put cables on all of those uh, uh, prongs that they had stuck into the rocks and run those cables over to the mast on the canopus and tightened it up. So the ship was tilted about 20 degrees or so to the starboard and they had put uh, pots of oil on the deck during the daytime and oily rags and set them on fire so that it would look like it was completely out of service. At nights when they needed to work downstairs or down below decks uh, in the machine shops, they would loosen all of the cables she would set back up. They would work all night long doing all of the stuff that they needed, servicing submarines, uh, helping a, a, a company of marines that were not too far away, helping them if they had a broken machine gun, some artillery pieces that needed some work, or uh, weapons that needed to be uh, repaired. They did all of that and uh, did it quite successfully. Just before dawn, tighten up all of those cables, tilt her back over to the side, light the pots, and all of the sailors would go into the jungle and spend the day uh, sleeping or resting or whatever they wanted to do. The Marines came over and helped them out a lot, and then they helped the Marines a lot. So it was really a two-way street. Uh, the Navy Whites, they found that those didn't work real good in the jungles. It was too much of a target. So they had the cook uh, boil up a lot of coffee, several big urns full of coffee. They took the coffee and the coffee grounds and washed all of those whites in that mess, which turned them almost into a fatigue color. So they weren't nearly as visible uh, back in the jungle. There was much activity at night. Those machine shops were kept busy and their sailors doing something, looks like a lathe. Anything that they couldn't repair, they could build another one just like it. So it was real handy to have them in a war zone. Uh, another welder that was doing some work, and uh, these guys don't look real happy, but I suppose if you're in the Navy, you don't smile a lot anyway. But, uh, Boy, it doesn't take them long to turn on you, does it? <laughs> and there's one of the real nice torpedoes that they had stored. There were enough of those on the Canopus to uh, uh, supply the Navy for the rest of the war, I think. They serviced a lot of subs until the 8th and the 9th of uh, April of 1942. And at that time, Corregidor was about to fall. They were ordered to disable everything on the Canopus and get it ready to be scuttled, uh, which is a hard thing to take if you're on a ship and you love the ship, you love what it's doing, and now someone's telling you that you need to take it out into the water and sink it. So the guys down below decks uh, took their welders, they took their uh, cutting torches, cut up whatever they could, welded a lot of things together so that they would never work again, uh, threw all of the breech blocks from their weapons overboard, and on uh, the 9th of April, 1942, Bataan fell and the ship was scuttled. And it was, this is what the harbor looked like because they were doing it with a lot of different ships. And again, it's a drawing from one of the sailors. And the Canopus was scuttled right here, which is just not that far away from where it had been uh, anchored before. So things were starting to look pretty bad. May the 6th of 1942, General Wainwright, who was in charge of all of the military on the islands in the Philippines, uh, he decided that he was gonna save a lot of lives if he surrendered. 
So he ordered everyone to lay down their arms. 11,500 men laid down their arms and became prisoners of war. Things started to get ugly. This is one of the first places that they put POWs. And what it is, you can't really tell, but it's a large concrete ramp where seaplanes would land in the water and then they could taxi up that concrete. And that's all they had was the concrete, a place to sit. Uh, the Japanese were not ready to feed and clothe and have medical care for 11,500 people. It just was not existent at all. So there was a lot of, uh, a lot of different diseases and guys that, uh, some guys that had died there. Uh, this is a Japanese picture that was captured and, and these prisoners are coming out of a cave, one of the caves that was on uh, the Philippines. It says captured Japanese photograph. And another picture of a, a whole bunch of GIs with their uh, hands in the air in surrender. Uh, it was looking very, very dim. My grandmother, I'm sorry, uh, Rosella, Paul's wife, got this telegram. And basically what it says is that uh, uh, Paul Edward Perry uh, was captured. And that's all he really knew, that he was captured. He didn't know where he was, where he was going, or anything else. But this was the telegram that she got. The Canopus crew was somewhere in that mess. And this, again, is that uh, uh, where the seaplanes come in, uh, back here off of the sea and taxi up. This was all concrete, probably 15 acres worth of it, with some hangers along one side. So it was makeshift tents and whatever they could find to uh, make life a little bit easier. It didn't stop the fact that the Japanese were beating these guys daily and that they had uh, very little food, very little water, and almost no medical attention at all. This is where the crew of the Canopus wound up, Billy Bid, and that was a, uh, a regular prison with the Bureau of Prisons on the island. Japanese took it over and put all of those prisoners in there. At least this kept them confined, but still uh, very little food, very little water, and an ugly existence. Uh, they later went from that place to a, a cabana tan, uh, camp number two, and it was worse than this one. And they spent 164 days there. Again, very little food, very little water. Uh, this was Billy Bid, the way it was laid out. The main area in the center, and then all the rest of these were where all of the prisoners were housed. So that was probably the nicest place that they were in. This other place that they went to, Cabanatan, um, within about a month of being there, 300 of the prisoners died from diphtheria. There was one medical officer from the army that was with the Canopus crew almost this entire time, but his hands were completely tied. There wasn't any medication that he could get. Uh, he could diagnose what the problem was and tell the guys, you know, hang on, the war is going to be over soon. I uh, can't give you anything. They tried to make him as comfortable as they could, but really no medical attention at all. There was a place called Palawan, and it was not too far from one of the POW camps. The Japanese took 150 prisoners on a work detail, and they took them into the jungle and had them build a bomb shelter. When they were finished with it, it was about 30 feet long, probably 15 feet wide, and about 8 feet deep. The Japanese took every one of those prisoners, all 150 of them, down inside of that bomb crater, or the bomb shelter, poured gasoline in there and set it on fire. Four of the guys managed to escape, and they were all gunned down by machine gun fire before they could get into the trees. Pulled those bodies back and threw them in, and when it was all over, they just covered it up with bulldozers. 150 men, and a lot of those were from the Canopus. A 
let's see, 1,500 volunteers. Uh, they wanted uh, 1,500 volunteers to, to go to another camp, and that's all they were told. And a lot of the sailors thought, you know, it's got to be better than the place that we're in. Little did they know that it was going to be really, really ugly, and it had been ugly enough before. So 1,500 of them volunteered. They marched them down to the docks, and at the docks, uh, on their way down, 1,500 were told, uh, their names were all called out. There was one Japanese guard that was an older gentleman, and he had befriended some of the, uh, the prisoners, and he liked some of those Americans. And he told them with tears in his eyes, he said, you're going to Japan. And at that time, that was a death sentence. Turned out it was. This was the ship, and it was called the Nogato Maru. And the guys that were on there called it the Gato or the Ghetto, because that was just about what it was. It was uh, called a hell ship, and there were several of those that hauled prisoners back and forth, uh, mostly from Manila up to Japan. They put 1,500 sailors and Marines in the bottom of this ship. And it was so crowded that none of them could sit down. They were standing basically shoulder to shoulder because they were actually packed into the hold of that ship. They had five honey buckets for waste, not nearly enough for 1,500 guys. One man that came on board uh, got violently sick and vomited and covered four different sailors. And temperatures started to rise a little bit, but they knew that there was nothing that they could do. Uh, one of the stories I read is that one other sailor had died and never hit the deck because there was no place for him to fall. That's how bad the situation was on this ship. They finally got to the point where they could split up and about 500 of them at a time could sleep but not very comfortably. And then that 500 would get up and 500 more would try to lay down somewhere. On their way to Japan, they were hit twice uh, or attacked twice by submarines. One of the submarines fired two torpedoes and the captain of the ship was able to turn the Gato enough in time that the, two, uh, the torpedoes went down both sides of the ship. They were attacked one other time and those torpedoes missed. Of course, the Navy submariners, they had no clue what was on it. All they knew was a Japanese ship, and they were probably hauling uh, materials and stuff for the war back and forth. Below decks on that ship, there was vomiting, diarrhea, beriberi, uh, dysentery. And dysentery was uh, described as abdominal pain and nausea, vomiting, and diarrhea. No light, no air and putrid didn't even come close to describing what was below decks. The guards never went down there. All of the hatches were sealed and, and closed uh, because the guards didn't want to go down there. It was just, it was too much for them even to go down below decks. It took them 19 days to get to Japan and that was the route that they took. And somewhere along there, I'm not sure just where, that's where they were attacked by the Navy subs. They got to uh, the place, uh, it was Moji right here where the line comes in. There's Nagasaki and there's Hiroshima. So probably later on, some of those prisoners uh, got a chance to see uh, some of the clouds and the smoke and stuff from those two bombs. Up here was Osaka. And then on further up is Tokyo. So that was their welcome. They uh, initially went to the Yodagawa POW camp. And uh, I'm sorry, when they got off of the ship at, uh, after they docked, I'm trying to back that up. When they got off of the ship uh, after they had docked, uh, they were really glad to get a little fresh air for a change. The Japanese would not go down below decks to get them off of the ship. They stood at the top, upwind, 
uh, with their rifles and their uh, bayonets fixed and got all of those guys off of the ship, all 1,500 of them. They put them down on the dock, made them strip down to nothing. And for the first time in weeks, they got a bath. The only problem was it was cold seawater and a fire hose. One of the Japanese guards took this picture and probably would have been executed if they had known he had taken the picture. <clears throat> but they washed down 100 or 1,500 of them. 150 of them were sick and wounded, and they left those on the dock. The Japanese wanted them on the dock. The rest of them were marched off to the first uh, POW camp at uh, Yodagawa. Those 150 men were never heard from again. So the conditions there got even worse. It was an old steel mill. <clears throat> Four months before the liberation and later became part of the war crimes documents, uh, Rogan would have merc been mercif mercilessly beaten had the drawing been found by the guards. And again, it was uh, one of the POWs that drew this picture. There was another picture of it from down inside, and the prisoners were all in these different uh, units. But again, no water, uh, very little food, and uh, guys would wake up in the middle of the night with rats crawling across them. Uh, not a good place to be. Eventually, near Osaka, uh, this was called the uh, Ichioka Stadium. And it was uh, an old stadium that was not used anymore. And these are actually the bleachers along one side. And underneath of the bleachers is where they had the hospital. And again, the doctor was there, but nothing that he could do. Uh, there were no medications, uh, no bandages, nothing clean, nothing sterile. Uh, and that's where they spent uh, the last days. One of the prisoners uh, drew this. Uh, this is probably a goalpost, but underneath of the bleachers, uh, a bunk and a bunk and a small table uh, and a couple of uh, benches. And that was another sketch by uh, one of the POWs. And this says uh, board fence with bamboo spears on the top of it so that you couldn't crawl out of there at all. The doctor was trying to keep a log, and this came out after the war. And right here is Uncle Paul, the, sec or the 29th day of February in 1943. And on there it says, died of dysentery. Uh, dysentery, beriberi, uh, all of these different medical terms. Uh, a lot of them died from starvation, from being beaten and killed. And that's the way a lot of them looked when they got out of Billy Bid. Again, this was a Japanese photograph, I think, that was captured, but you can see these guys are not in good shape. Uh, these were hale, hardy uh, soldiers and airmen and marines and, and sailors and it just wound up being nothing. The doctor kept track of deaths. 1942 in December, there were 11 that died, 43, 18 that died in January, and 19 in February, and one of those was Uncle Paul. Died on the 19th of February. And the family was notified that not only was he not missing in action and not a POW, but he was, in fact, deceased. How did they know that? Uh, the Red Cross, I think, primarily. Uh, the Red Cross, I think, was still involved, but uh, they did the war. And if you look at this, it's actually a form letter, everything that's typed. The date was left off. <laughs> Uh, the greeting was left off, and in the specifics of who they were talking about was left off. And I guess because they had so many of them to do. So this was January the 26th, and 
this portion here uh, is a serial number for Uncle Paul, U.S. Navy, uh, Ichioka Stadium, uh, date of death from dysentery. Uh, and he said, I was the only medical officer in this camp, and they had a space here to put whatever the camp was. This one here, it surprised me. It says, I want to assure you that he received no harsh treatment from the Japanese except that common to the whole camp, which says nothing. <laughs> but in writing this, I'm sure he had in mind that the families would probably prefer not to know how he really died or how the rest of them died. He received all of the care and medicine that we could give him. That says nothing because there wasn't anything to give him. I blew it up there so you could read it a little better. But <clears throat> So he, he wrote an awful lot of these letters uh, after the war. And Evelyn was waiting for Daddy. Now I'm going to back up just a little bit, intentionally, of course. My dad, on the 8th of December of 1941, the day after Pearl Harbor, tried to enlist. Tried all of the military services, nobody would take him. The reason, he had a wife, two kids, and a farm. And the farm is what made him ineligible to be drafted. That went on for a long time. Early 1945, things started to change. Uh, the U.S. knew that eventually they're going to have to invade Japan. And estimates were that a million men would die during the invasion. And if you're interested, there's the pictures there in a Life magazine of the invasion plans and all of the beaches that they would have hit. My dad would have never made it. And because of those two bombs, I got 50 more years out of that guy. And they were good years. He served from uh, April of 45 to uh, February of 46. And of course, the uh, war ended in uh, late 45. Uh, they sent Dad to Japan, but he didn't have to hit a beach. He went over on the USS Randolph and was uh, luckily stationed near Osaka. Uh, his company commander had a jeep, and he told my dad, he said, anytime you're off duty, you take that Jeep, you go wherever you want to go, do whatever you have to do, but find your brother. So that was his whole, his whole mission while he was in Japan. This temple was the Juganji Temple, and it was near Osaka. And just through uh, blind luck, I think more than anything, he found that his dad or his brother his ashes might have been in that temple. He had uh, corresponded and met the, uh, the chief Buddhist priest, Shinkai Yamaguchi, and it was a very nice man, and told him, uh, number one, that he could not get inside of the temple. There were signs on the outsides of all of those temples that had ashes in them uh, off limits to military personnel. Why, I'm not sure, but he couldn't go inside. This picture, this next one, I have looked at probably a thousand times over the years. And it shows the British, a box of British. There were 381 bags in that one. Uh, American there. Yeah, I can hardly see that, but it's an old, old picture and been reproduced a lot of times. It did have a military MP inside guarding it, and then uh, Dr. Or, uh, the priest, Dr. A. Yamaguchi. But Dad could never get in there. And of course, who knows what was in a bag of ashes. Probably they took silk bags and a handful of ashes, stuffed it in there, and put a name on it. But it was closure, closure to the family. This was the last picture that my dad took of the temple uh, when he left to come back to the States. 
It's underneath of the X up there. Uh, Private Virgil Perry's photo of the Juganji Temple in Osaka, where the remains of Allied prisoners of war dead from Osaka camp were found stored at the war's end, and signs that said, off limits to soldiers. This picture was the only one that was photoshopped into the book, uh, Evelyn, Paul, and Rosella. After Rosella found out about Paul's death, she later remarried and uh, was living in California. And another picture on the bottom of Rosella and the baby. Be back up here for just a second. My granddad passed away. Uh, that was Paul's father. He passed away early October of 1948 and very shortly after that within a day or so my grandmother found out that Uncle Paul's ashes were coming back to Kansas. So she delayed Grandpa's funeral until those ashes came back into town. I was 10 years old that day and it was the most uh, tremendous thing I had ever seen. The mortuary was completely filled with flowers. You couldn't have got another stem in there at all. The people were sitting around in the mortuary and they were very quiet, a little bit of talking. And what they were doing was waiting for the train to come into town with Uncle Paul on it. Finally, we heard the train pull into town and everybody stepped outside because they could see all the way down the street to the train station. And we stood there and watched Marine or the sailor Navy honor guard walking up from the train station, five of them. Two guys on the outside had rifles and their rifles were on the outside shoulder to protect the ashes. The next two guys had the flag of the U.S. and the flag of Kansas and the sailor in the middle was carrying that bronze uh, urn with the ashes in it. As they walked up the street, the cars on the streets would pull over. People would get out of their cars and stand at attention next to the car with their hand over their hearts. That's just the way it was done in World War II. They watched everybody go by. The ashes were brought into the mortuary by this honor guard and they were placed on a small table next to granddad's casket. This is the urn and the table. This is a picture of Uncle Paul. That picture had been passed down to my dad and from my dad to me. And I am proud to say it's hanging on my wall at home. And it'll always be there. This was one of the roughest parts of it. Uh, a lot of uh, Viet vets that were there uh, and everyone expressing their sincere condolences to the family. After the funeral, we went to the cemetery and it was out east of El Dorado. And that's where they were buried, the two of them. Uh, the father with the son right next to him. They played taps over the gravesite. And I have a hard time listening to taps even now. But they played taps for the two. And then there was someone else a, a small distance away that played taps again, not nearly as loud. And my mother told me later that the first person that plays taps, it was a warning to heaven that there was a sailor or a GI coming to heaven. And the other person that played taps, that was supposed to be the answer from heaven that he had arrived. And I don't see that done anymore at all. But I remember it happening that day. And of course, it was the sailor that played the taps. A couple of sidelines, or side sidelines. Yeah, the POW count in uh, Japan 
There were 27,000 prisoners of war housed in Japan. Half of those did not come back. Couldn't all have been from diseases. I'm sure of that. After the war, when the prisoners were released, 90% of those that came back were on stretchers. Can't be because of diseases. The order for all of the guards was if the Allies came to invade, every POW was to be executed. That never happened. After the war, the guards and the camp commanders were prosecuted for war crimes. One of them was sentenced to death and later commuted to a life sentence. The rest of them were all sentenced to life in prison. In 1958, our Congress passed a law and under an act of Congress, every one of those bastards was released. None of them were treated nearly as bad as they treated our guys. I have one announcement to make. Uh, Evelyn, of course, was uh, Paul's only daughter. And I am proud to say that the grandson of my uncle Paul is here today, Bill and his wife, Lisa. <clears throat> I have one more thing to do. This is from one GI to another. You're welcome to join if you want. Seaman First Class Paul Edward Perry. Rest in peace, sailor. God knows you've earned it. Twenty-one seconds. I want to thank everybody for being here today, and I hope to see you again. And thanks to Mike for the invitation to come back. Thank you. I'd be glad to answer. Thank you so much. I mean, this was You're such welcome. a stirring, I mean, I'm glad impactful you liked it. talk. And I think, if nothing else, it reminds us all of the sacrifice our veterans have been called upon. I often think that those uh, torpedoes might have been a blessing mm -hmm. if they'd hit the ship. Yeah. But some of them lived and some of them yes. didn't. Uh, do you have time for questions? Yes. Questions, anyone? Mm -hmm. I got a, In the back, sir. Not so much questions. What you said about <coughs> taps, two things. When I was in grade school in the early 50s, my principal was a uh, artillery captain during the First World War. And every Memorial Day, or and for around Memorial Day, he would have a student in one part of the uh, school building play taps, and it would be echoed from a distant part of it. Now I understand why he did that. Oh, I, I hope that's true. It yeah. sounded uh, plausible to me, but uh, that's what my mother told me. And she'd been to a lot of those funerals, and I had. So. I, Taps also has uh, two or three verses of words. Uh, I figured there was no way I could recite that today. Anyone else? Well, thank you very much for thank coming you. and uh, happy memorial. Thank you. And please stick around and talk with Tracy and his family. Uh, and join us uh, in about 10 minutes for a look at our Dancing with the Stars. Uh,